Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Florence Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. My name is Sally, and I am gathered here today by a bunch of foofers and somebody from Colorado. So we'll get to meet Jason in a moment. At this time, I'm going to ask two of you to start Spirit of Life. Join in and sing with us. Spirit of life, come unto me, sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion, blow in the wind, arise in the sea, move in the hand, giving life to shape the job. to the other side. Okay. And you're going to put your mask on. <laughs> and I know you'll come back up here in a minute because you have an announcement. <laughs> mask on. So, we have a board meeting coming up this Wednesday at 3.30. And final details of our annual celebration and visioning retreat are finally being put to finalized final stick. And you should receive a Zoom invite very shortly. And uh, what's happening around the world this week or this month? thought you might want to know that Ramadan is celebrated from April 12th to May 11th. April 14th marks the 1978 death of Sophia Lyon Faz, who is revered among Unitarian Universalists as the dynamic innovator who revolutionized religious education by making it child-centered and incorporating modern, modern educational precepts. Climate Change Month continues through April 22nd, which marks the official Earth Day that began in 1970. Where were you in 1970? I have Earth shoes. You know, those, those things that went like this, you felt like you were walking uphill with every step. The Fair Housing Act was passed on April 11th, 1968. Thank you, LBJ. Next week, we are delighted to have our own Reverend Elizabeth here for a long weekend. She's going to help us with our retreat as well as be here next Friday for uh, recording our service live. Uh, and through her newsletter, she's reached out to share her availability for anyone needing spiritual guidance. So check the newsletter, okay? And her sermon next week is titled, Emerging from the Chrysalis. And if that weren't fabulous enough, our own Tuvia is creating a wonderful Earth Day celebration that we will be recording in two weeks. And Tuvia, I'm going to have you come forward and talk a little bit about that and anything else you'd like to. You know, I've noticed that when you wear these masks, you just kind of like lose your sense of balance and everything else like that. The world is a mask. Get your shots, folks, so we can get through this. Um, we are going to be having an Earth Day presentation, and we're inviting uh, members of our food community that want to participate. Uh, we're going to be taping uh, at my place, which has got the sand dunes and lakes and beautiful spots. And if you have a poem or a story uh, or a song, anything that you want to... Uh, contribute that has something to do with our beloved planet Earth, please email me. Uh, I'm on the list, or uh, you'll find me uh, if you need me. It's so, in the newsletter. It's in the newsletter. newsletter. Okay, got it. Yep. The other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, Yom HaShoah. This is a very serious holiday. Um, it was observed this past Wednesday and Thursday. The name comes from the Hebrew word Shoah, which means whirlwind, 
Yom HaShoah was established in Israel in 1959 by law, coinciding with the 27th of Nisan, which is a Hebrew date, to mark the beginning of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in 1943, when Jewish resistance fire, fighters defied the Nazis and fought for freedom and dignity. We must never forget, lest history be allowed to repeat itself again. Nothing in human history compares with the whirlwind of hate, evil, and pain, and it is inappropriate to use the somber event of Yom HaShoah to compare with anything else, because the Holocaust stands alone. On this occasion, we recite the poem, A Lee, A Lee, O God, O God, a poem written by Hannah Senesch who was one of 32 Jewish volunteer parachutists from Palestine, from Palestine that the British Army sent behind German lines for resistance and rescue efforts. On June 7, 1944, Senesch infiltrated German-occupied Hungary. The Germans captured her, and after several months of torture, they executed Senesch by firing squad she was only 23 years old. And so she wrote this poem, and we sing it in memoriam of Hannah Senesch and for all the others who lost their lives during this dark time in human history. And I'll just say the poem, it's very short, but there's a lot of meaning behind it. Oh God, oh God, I pray that these things never end. The sand and the sea, the rush of the water, the crash of the heavens, the prayer of the heart. Amen. Amen. Thank you, two of you. Are there any other announcements that you would like to share? Maybe we can have joys and concerns coming up, but any other announcements? Okay, that's great. At this time, I would like to invite Zana to come forward. We're going to light our chalice, and the words are come from Reverend Scott Taylor, entitled, In Honor of First Steps. So we're going to light this candle here, and you're welcome to light your own candle at your own home. We light this chalice in honor of first steps, for beginning even when the path ahead is unclear, for the courage it takes to trust the way will reveal itself, that light will come to clarify our vision that friends will be our, on our side. May the words, song, stillness, and common breath of this hour we are together remind us that every step of the way is never one we take alone. Catherine, would you like to come forward and share joys and concerns? And then I have a little note here about mm -hmm. uh, sharing our opening song. Thank you. I'll put the mask upside down backwards. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. This is our section of the ceremony for joys and concerns. This is our commitment to each other, to witness each other's accomplishments and sorrows. And in this witnessing, create a relationship of support and welcoming inclusion. However, we can extend ourselves to do so. In prayer, intention, or in direct service. I'll start with a joy, and I believe Jay, that's, this is the biggest joy right here. He's behind the camera, but I'm going to say it. His home was delivered. <laughs> and Pam, of course, and Pam. Although I know he's probably doing all the hookup work and everything like that. But how how wonderful. You've been waiting months. Very happy for you. I have another joy. Lynn Ann Cogart sold her house to a neighbor after a conversation about plants. She decided to, she sold it herself directly, she decided to go to her next door neighbor and talk about the, you know, do you want some of my plants? And the woman bought the house the next day. Wow. That's a joy. I love that. I have another joy. My callers for 
of the care committee have enjoyed have have reported much enjoyment from connecting through their calls with the conversation. This brings me much joy. Shell? Mm -hmm. How about four shells? Four. Oh, no. All of them. Two, three, four. I dropped one on the floor. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, anyone else have something? You have a joy happening? Okay. I do. Come on up. The word has been floating around, but I want to make it absolutely clear how joyful I am <laughs> that I now have a place to live in Florence. <laughs> except what's in the cart that we get unloaded today is in that space mm -hmm. and uh, there's going to be a little work done to make it even better than it is. But it's light and it's bright and it's easy access and I get to be in this community. Thank you all. <laughs> One more. Super kudos to this woman over here, Catherine, and her husband, Steve, and their friend, Dick. They were above and beyond. This woman is amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, I've been trying to get back out for a year, so it is an absolute joy to be here, <laughs> to, to get to see everyone that I do, and uh, not a worry in the world, so no concerns. <laughs>
fails. Toward the end of this reading, there is a sentence that refers to enabling us to reach this moment, which is an adaptation of a Hebrew prayer. In Leslie's words, it's a blessing for anything you do, something you haven't done in a long time, or you're doing something for the first time, or for the first time in over a year, or for when you survive a close call, or when you are about to do something adventurous. That's that sentence that starts with enabling us to reach this moment. I invite Raymond to come forward and share Leslie's special message titled, All That We Have Been, All That We Will Become. Good morning. All that we have been separately and all that we will become together is stretched out before and behind us like stars scattered across a canvas of sky. We stand at the precipice, arms locked together like tandem skydivers, mm. working up the courage to jump. Tell me, friends, what have we got to lose? Mm -hmm. Our fear of failure? Our mistrust of our own talents? What do we have to lose? A poverty of spirit? The lie that we are alone. Mm. What wonders await us in the space between the first leap and the moment our feet, our wheels, however we move our bodies across this precious earth, touch down softly on unknown soil. What have we got to lose that we can't replace with some previously unimaginable joy? Blessed are you, spirit of life, who has sustained us, enlivened us, and enabled us to reach this moment. Give us courage in our leaping and gratitude in our landing. And share with us in the joy of a long and fruitful ministry together. And now, I would like to introduce our very precious and new resident of Florence, <laughs> whose talk is titled, What Are We Becoming? We are living in a time when nothing that was familiar seems to last long. When the world around us seems to be turning into something we hardly recognize. What does that mean? What are we becoming? Today, Reverend Dr. Ruth Miller will put on her futurist hat to give us some insights into these times and our potential tomorrows. Welcome, Reverend Ruth. is the beginning. And what is it beginning? 
It's beginning a next stage in a process, an ongoing infinite process that never began by some belief and never will end by almost every spiritual belief, really, called becoming. Becoming. That becoming is sometimes called evolving. That becoming is sometimes called learning. That becoming is sometimes called catastrophe. <laughs> As things go on that we don't anticipate or that you know, push buttons that we didn't even know we had or in some way cause the pattern of highly structured life that we had been living to crash. And in that crash is where the seed of the new becoming emerges. And that's where springtime as the beginning of the year feels appropriate because this is when the seeds are beginning to feel a little warmth and beginning to wiggle around inside their shells and beginning to send out roots and shoots. And as that seed begins to send out more and more roots and shoots, it begins to engage with other plants and other beings, other microbes and critters in the soil and in the air. And that interaction leads to more and more tra you know, tradition, if you will, rules, ways of doing things that become a norm. And then the norm becomes the rules. <laughs> And the, then there is the more of the sharing, but now it's in terms of the rules and the procedures and so on, until we get to that point where we're so highly structured that the catastrophe happens again. In the annual cycle of the seasons, winter feels like that catastrophe. The winter storms, whether they're on our terms here on the coast where we get the big waves and the king tides and the wind that never seems to stop, <laughs> or whether it's the ice and the snow up north, or whether it's the dust storms in other places. I, I lived in the LA long enough to learn about the Santa Anas. <laughs> And whatever it is that seems to be ripping the world apart, and then we move into this gentle time of becoming and being aware that we are becoming. So, what is it that we are becoming at this point in human experience? I have to put in a footnote here. There was a headline on one of my news feeds that was pretty wrong. Um, it said that Homo sapiens was eating meat for two and a half million years. Well, no. Homo sapiens has only been around maybe 75,000 years. But the genus Homo appears to have emerged about two and a half million years ago in the form of Homo habilis. And those early, early folks apparently mostly lived off the meat that they caught and did not gather so much. Now some of that has to do with where they were and how they lived, uh, how they could live where they were. But um, yeah, the early, early form of the hominids ate mostly meats for a while <laughs> and then moved on to other things. So the paleo diet was what that headline I think was commenting on. The rest of us have been living on a mixture of all kinds of things. So I'm bringing this up partly because there is a fairly low probability, but a possibility, that our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will be living like the very early hominids. Because the structures that we have put in place have you know, reached the point where a particular kind of fluctuation, and we don't even know what it will be, could cause us to go into catastrophe and complete that is a possibility. It is a low probability. Almost non-existent probability if we look at the whole planet. Now, every now and then someone will ask me why I stopped being a futurist and why I started being a minister. There was about a two-year overlap as I was phasing one in and the other out. 
And the reason I stopped being a professional futurist, quite apart from why I chose to go into ministry, was because every single scenario that any of the futurists I had ever worked with or read or studied had ever produced was happening at that time in the world now. You could find a place where that scenario was happening. So it didn't, it stopped being about when, it started being about where. For example, you know that super sci-fi, high-tech, you know, urban environment that we were taught in the 50s, 60s, and 70s was going to be the future of the 21st century. And I don't see it anywhere in this country, but I do see it in videos and photographs of some of the Arab states and China. There was another set of scenarios where people would go back to living more simply and, and live in harmony with the land and build community and where in doing so they would be able to thrive almost any through almost any catastrophe because they would be using different kinds of technologies to make sure that they have the resources they need and they weren't going to be putting it all in the landfill the way we have been for the last 50, 60 years. Well, that is happening in about 3% of the land mass that is the United States in many of the Nordic states and in parts of Europe, and believe it or not, in a significant part of India. They are reclaiming ancient methods to restore land that has become a hard pan where you can't even break it with a pick. And they're beginning to restore them so they can retain the monsoon waters instead of just run off and flood everything. So we're starting to see the emergence of that scenario in various places around the world. There were other scenarios. One was the total breakdown and disaster. And we have seen that in the world over and over again for the last 50 years, you know, particularly in Africa and in some parts of Asia, where things have just fallen apart between the political economic situation and the ecological situation, whether it be climate change or whether it simply be the soil as in India where there has been hard pan, it's happening all over the world, desertification of lush farmland and then no way to support the population. The image that comes to mind is Mad Max. <laughs> Too many parts of the world have been dealing with those issues without the radioactivity yet. We keep holding on to that possibility that that won't be running our lives. But that scenario is a little tiny bit in place in our own country where the people who were downwind of the tests in eastern Washington, Idaho, and Nevada we're dealing with and still are dealing with the genetic consequences of the radioactivity from those nuclear tests and atomic bomb tests. So as I say, I stopped doing that as a profession because all I had to do was say, well, if you go there, you can have that one. If you go over there, you can have that one. You know, and you get to choose in this moment which direction you want your life to go. We get to choose in this moment, each of our communities, each of our households, how we want to be experiencing the next 10, 50, 100 years. And some of us are going to be on the planet for another 50 years. Believe it or not, even those of us who have seen the post-war baby boom as our norm <laughs> may even be here. And that is one of the things we are becoming. We are becoming more long lived we are becoming more aware of ways that our behaviors and our choices has caused the body to age and we are choosing otherwise, more and more of us. So one of the things that is happening is we're getting a split in the what I call Western culture or empire culture or the culture of control. We're getting those who are going with what was normal for them and we're getting 
a bunch of people, increasing numbers every year of people are saying, no, we don't have to do it that way anymore. There is another way. There is a way to become who I was born to be, not who I was told I was. And we are always, as some motivational speakers put it, at choice. Every moment, we get to choose. Am I going to go with who I was told I have to be or am? Or am I going to be the essential self that I am? I was, one of the jobs that I do is I help people um, do uh, cha transform organizations. And one of my clients is putting together a little guidebook, and I'm, I get to put it together. He hands me the materials, I create the book. And the materials that he handed me that I was working on it through this morning were telling us, based on the work of the Stanford Business School, that if we want to have organizations that thrive, the leaders need to become their essential selves. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. A business consultant in a business school is telling people this. But they have to stop long enough to find out who that is. <laughs> and for some entrepreneurs, that's a pretty tricky thing to do. And so part of what we're doing in this work that I'm involved in is helping to create a process within the organization where the very act of doing the operations of the business help us to become more aware of who we are and our essential selves. And we get to reflect that back at each other. And then we get to move from that place. And one of the um, business um, benefits of doing this is if I am being me and my company and my organization are all being who we are, there's nobody else out there like us. There is no competition. Isn't that cool? And for me, as someone who's been looking at how the culture has evolved, competition is one of the means we have been controlled in empire culture. We have been taught we have to do better than them. We have to compare ourselves to them, whoever them is. You know, Pogo says they are us, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if we're busy doing that, there's no way we can be our essential selves. So, to begin to include in the operation of the organization opportunities to reflect and see Oh, that's where my joy is. That's where my gifts are. That's where my talents lie. Okay, you mean I don't have to do this thing I'm not all that good at anymore? You mean I can choose something that is effortless for me? That is energizing for me? Oh my goodness. You mean I can enjoy work? That is cool. There are thousands, literally thousands, of groups within companies all over Western culture, Europe and the US, who are beginning to operate this way. And some, maybe a dozen or three dozen country, companies, some of those companies are very large, <laughs> that are engaging in these processes. And I'm being able to be part of that. Now you can see how that in itself helps people to choose who I am instead of who I was told to be. And it will lead people, and has, we've seen this over and over again in the 10, 12 years that these techniques are being implemented, actually close to 20, 25, but we only understood them for 10 or 12. And that is we're seeing people make healthier choices in other aspects of their life. They're eating better, they're sleeping better, they're relating more healthily to the people in their world outside of work, which is continuing that process. I don't have to eat what I was told to eat. I don't have to live by the commercials. 
I don't have to. All those things that our culture has encouraged us to do in order to stay controlled by the culture. For some reason, the word sugar keeps coming up in my head. <laughs> And I think it is actually one of the key shifts. Those of us, well, first of all, I want to say, you cannot live in America without being addicted to sugar. You can get over the addiction, you can recover from the addiction. But the American diet, the, virtually every product that one attempts to acquire has sugar in it. The other day I picked up a carton of chicken broth. And every single broth in three brands included chicken. I mean, not chicken, sugar. <laughs> Whether it was chicken, beef, or vegetable, it included sugar. What? Right? I had to find a brand in another, I went to three stores. I finally found a store that had a brand that didn't have sugar in the broth. And it's not just the sugar, it's the sweet. Now, I'm one of those women who at the time, it was rather strange, I nursed my children. And in the process of nursing one's children, one ends up tasting the milk <laughs> sooner or later. And the milk is very sweet. It's sweet and a little fatty. Very much like a whole milk latte. Mm. Sweet, a little bit fatty, and warm. And I am convinced that that's part of why lattes got to be so popular. <laughs> right? Because they are very similar to mother's milk, especially when they get to body temperature. Okay? <laughs> they are a return to that at a time when we were, as a culture, what one of my colleagues calls in the age of anxiety. What this past year did is began to cause us to wake up to how anxious we were. Some of us are feeling more anxiety now than we thought we were feeling a year ago, but I'm going to say it's because we are now more sensitive to it. Because there have been fewer stressors and we're not riding the adrenaline anymore. So now when we get a little bit, we go, oh. Whereas before, we were operating at a much higher level of anxiety, pretty much across Western culture. And interestingly, the sale of lattes has gone down. <laughs> and it's not just because people are staying home, because Starbucks was running a full profit for a while. Ah, uh, yes. And that's one of the causes of our anxiety. You can't hear it on the tape. There is a cell phone going. <laughs> and the person is anxiously trying to turn it off. <laughs> mm. Yeah. There is an experiment going on. Someone was willing to give people $200 if they would commit to blocking, blocking up every electronic item for 24 They didn't get a whole lot of takers. Really? Every, you know, the watches, the phones, the computers, the game machines, everything locked up for 24 hours. One would think that young know, people would jump at it. They couldn't imagine it. They couldn't imagine life without it. What are we becoming? Are we becoming attack apps on our electronics, <laughs> right? Is that they are the things that are having life and we're just making it happen for them? <laughs> Lynn Margulis, a very, very popular, effective microbiologist, one of the reasons we have Earth Day, used to say that human beings were invented by microbes so that we could carry them around. <laughs> And there are a number of futurists who have said that human beings are, exist to create the technological life forms that then will take over. Right? 
we get to choose. Right? Now there's one more level on choice here. I've been talking pretty much at the behavioral material level. Am I a human being who occasionally has a spiritual experience? Or am I, as a lot of teachers have said, a spiritual being temporarily housed in a human body? That temporary can be as long as I choose if I consider myself to be a spiritual being and if I act from that knowing in my activity. What am I becoming? Am I becoming a, an elder in my culture, telling, sharing my life, Am I becoming something beyond anything any of us have ever imagined? And that is a human that has fully harmonized and integrated my spiritual essence in my human form. There are methods in the world that have been around for thousands of years to help people do that. To be spiritual beings having a human experience and then choosing either to transform the body into the energy of spirit and be able to come in and out. We call that the resurrection and the ascension in the Christian tradition. In the Buddhist tradition, they simply say that, you know, if someone has transcended and moved on, they've gotten off the wheel of karma. They don't ever have to come back. And they can choose to be in form if they choose to. In the Tamil part of India, the southern part of India, it's called the Siddha tradition, S-I-D-D-H-A. And there are documented cases of 18 Siddhas who have been able to transform in this way. This does not include Mahababaji, the one who is known as the young man, the 18-year-old forever youthful Babaji. He has chosen to stay in his body. His birth date was in 1493. And people still get to see him now and then in his 18-year-old body. And so, he made some choices. He made some pretty intense choices. He almost died on the path to getting there. But he did get there. And now there are groups of both Western and Indian, East Indian, and some Tibetans, who study with him, who meditate with him up in the Himalayas. And periodically, he or one of them show up and are helpful to people on the path today. Now, I'm saying that as fact. I haven't experienced it, but the people that I know of who have are very trustworthy. Another thing that some of the Buddhas do, and we are all potentially Buddhas, there's not just one, is they will be in meditation and they will say, I am done and they will carefully transform every organ in their body to light. And all that will be left is their clothing, their fingernails, which are not alive, and their hair. Over 150 students of the current Dalai Lama's meditation teacher have done this. So this has gone on in our lifetime. What am I becoming? We choose. We choose every moment. Am I going to go with the patterns I was handed by the culture? Or am I going to explore and discover who I am? Who is my essential self as a human being? Who is my spiritual self as a spiritual being? And how am I going to move forward? And how are we as a community going to move forward? Are we going to support people in becoming who they truly are, more fully? Or are we going to encourage them to stay in the cultural norm? 
we get to choose. I love the food community because there is always that room for being really weird. <laughs> Which is what happens when we become our essential and authentic self. <laughs> As we move out in the world out there, perhaps we can take that with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. You know, as you were talking there towards the end, I kept going back to a, a documentary I'm watching right now, the Ken Burns documentary on um, Hemingway. Yes, yes. And how fascinating and how he was so in his own way, knowing what exactly he needed to do, even though it was not the norm, it was boo-hooed, it was whatever, and he wrote what he needed to write, and uh, powerful indeed, a, a perfect example of your own know, path. Yeah. So, um, if you haven't seen it, the, the documentary on Henry Way, it's really quite extraordinary. So, thank you for that reminder. Thank you. You know, I'm thinking about not only FOOF, but uh, our community partner is FoodShare. And Florence FoodShare has become something of a mainstay here in Florence. They have to reevaluate and reimagine themselves and go with the flow. And they've had to do this this last year, like a lot of other community partners. Uh, and food share still relies on financial support of good people like us. So if you're listening to this today, which would be Sunday, maybe you're listening to it the following Monday or Tuesday, you know, think about what you might be able to do to help Florence Food Share continue to thrive. You can send a contribution to them directly if you'd like. You can mail it to us at, uh, at our fellowship, P.O. Box 2502, Florence 97439. You can click on our website, there's a donate button, you can make a donation there and we'll pass that along to them. You know, it's a nice thing to think about. If you have food items or products, pet supplies, etc., you can drop it off at FoodShare. Um, any way that you can help to support this community partner will be very much appreciated. As well, we ask you to continue your wonderful support of this fellowship. We sent out uh, to many folks uh, the opportunity to pledge your financial support to us, and we welcome you to continue to consider that. If you haven't done that, send us an email and let us know what you will pledge to support here in the next fiscal year starting in July. And I must say, there have been plenty of people who have not only pledged their support, they've prepaid their pledge. Whoa. And I'm thinking, wow, what a concept that is. So think about those two things, okay? And as we go forward here, and in your own home, I ask that you repeat after me, Divine love through me. Divine love through me. Blesses and multiplies all that I am. Blesses and multiplies all that I am. All that I give. All that I give. And all that I receive. And all that I receive. I am prosperous now. I am prosperous now. Blessed be. Blessed be. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to extinguish our chalice, the flame here and the flame at your home. So I invite Zana to come forward again. I share these words from Brian Keeley titled, Carry the Flame. The chalice, chalice is now being extinguished, but its light lives on in the minds and hearts and souls of each of you. Carry that flame with you as you leave this place or you leave your home and share it with those you know with those you love, and most especially with those you have yet to meet. Before we conclude with our peace song, I ask folks who want to sing the peace song to come forward again. Two of you will play this, but I want to share a quick uh, quote from Brene Brown. I love this woman. Mm -hmm. If you're going to find your way, our way, back to each other, vulnerability is the path and courage is the light. So set down those lists of what we're supposed to be. Is, is setting that list down, what we're supposed to be, is brave to ourselves and to support each other in the process of becoming real is perhaps the greatest single act of daring. So I invite you to sh join Tuvia and the rest of us as we sing our peace song. And I remind you, we have a Zoom call Sunday, 5 p.m. Ruth, are you going to join us? 
5 p.m. I don't know who the host is this week, but we'll figure it out. It'll be on the it'll be on the blast. Tuvia, take us away with the peace song. Thank you.